Welcome to my class and welcome to people who are watching online. To, this is the second of our GPI um, BAU talks that we just initiated this semester. Coordinated effort between the university and our think tank, the Global Policy Institute. So for today, I have the honor of introducing uh, Ahmed Sayed Dalzai, who is the well, it says here, you can see the former acting ambassador of Afghanistan in the UAE. But before that, he has a impressive career, both in the public sector and the private sector. Um, you know, he's an expert in geoeconomics, geopolitics, diplomacy, migration, economic diplomacy, and the like. Uh, we have known each other for about 10 years, I guess, when you were first posted in Istanbul. And for those of you who are in my class, I would also like to highlight the fact that uh, Sayer was a student of mine as well back in Istanbul in our master's in global policy program. So if you stick with it, put your nose to the grindstone, turn in all your work, show up on class, you could one day be a former acting ambassador or a current ambassador or even something else beyond that. In any case, um, I will not take up any more of his valuable time. So I would like to invite Snyder up here to talk about shadow economies and enabling of transnational threats. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Also, did you want to say something well, now ahead of time? I would like to introduce the uh, president of GPI. Okay, let's keep it very, very short uh, since we're already uh, a little bit late. So, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> I, of course, I know some of you because I have you in my classes. As a, as a, just to, to clarify and make it so that everybody understands. So, the Global Policy Institute, as you know, it's, it's a think tank uh, separate from but affiliated with. Uh, um, Bay Atlantic University. I'm privileged to serve as president. And uh, this semester, we sort of inaugurated this new uh, series uh, whereby we at GPI, working in conjunction with the faculty, uh, would, uh, do our best to, to bring to you great experts uh, who are going to enrich your, uh, you know, your classwork. So this is our second one. Last time we were talking about the Islamic uh, uh, and Silk Islamic World and Silk Road with another very distinguished uh, former ambassador you know, from, from Egypt and, and many other things. And so today we got Sayer, who is old friend of yours, new friend of mine, but great friend. So I'm very happy to have him and uh, enjoy the presentation. Sayer, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, to all of you that are here. And I see friends uh, who are logged in from abroad. Hello to everybody. So today's presentation will be about shadow economies and enabling of, thank you, uh, shadow economies and enabling of uh, transnational threats. They go Is hand it, in hand. Yes, because if, if we don't keep it close to you, it doesn't. They don't hear. Yeah, so shadow economies and enabling of transnational threats, they go hand in hand, especially, especially certain aspects of transnational threats associated with non-state actors. So first, I'm going to talk about the types of transnational threats, especially those that are associated with shadow economies. Of course, uh, transnational threats could emanate from state actors as well, but we're going to focus on non-state actors because this is where the shadow economies uh, become a breeding ground for, for these kind of groups and the threats that they pose. So broadly, we can categorize them into four types of uh, non-state actors that are associated with shadow economies. One is terrorist groups, uh, proxy militias used by certain countries as a, a source of influence in other countries, separatist groups, and mercenaries and PMCs, private military companies. This is a more recent and new phenomenon. We'll talk about that as well. Let's start with terrorist groups. Uh, the list is very long. Uh, if you look at the FBI list of, of uh, stated terrorist groups, every country has their own uh, list. But I want to talk about some of the well-known ones. Uh, uh, we can start with ISKP, also known as the Islamic State of Khorasan province. Uh, um, 
Daesh is another name for it, and uh, it, it really started in, in the Iraq uh, and Syria region. It was initially called uh, the Islamic State of uh, Iraq and Levant, uh, expanded into multiple provinces, including one in uh, where, where, where Afghanistan is now, but their geographical uh, boundaries are different from, from the way we, we see it in, in maps and states. It really has uh, found a place in Afghanistan because of the remote geography uh, there. It's, it's been almost eliminated in, in the Middle East, but a lot of their fighters have moved to Afghanistan and, and in the mountainous uh, parts of the eastern parts of the country. They are there. They are, um, uh, uh, they're, they're inviting their fellow uh, jihadists to migrate there, and, and they seem to be able to use the geography of Afghanistan to attacks around the world. Uh, one of the famous ones this year was the attack in Moscow, Prophet Saud. Uh, what makes them at the top of my list is uh, the fact that they are uh, very violent, they're very, um, uh, they're in a hurry to make attacks whenever they can, they do. Uh, they, they're also uh, a newer version in, in a sense that they, they have really embodied the concept of takfirism, or the, the license to excommunicate. Uh, they uh, use this license of takfirism to also kill fellow Muslims. Uh, they, the, those that they believe are not Muslim enough, not sufficiently Islamic, and, and of different sects, uh, often Shiites are their targets, and uh, they uh, feel that at times they have to kill fellow Muslims to be able to get to the infidels. They feel like fellow Muslims, especially states, uh, are, are often uh, standing between them and, and their targets. So uh, ISKP uh, often associated with uh, Salafist jihadism, because there is a lot of their the fatwas that they use belong to Ibn Taymiyyah and, and the likes, and, and that's what associates them. Uh, with that. Now, the second one in the list, Al-Qaeda, much more famous, uh, much longer history. They, uh, September 11 attacks uh, are what made them notorious, but they have been doing attacks in the 1990s. Uh, they are um, a, a group that uh, has been away from the spotlight for a while, uh, largely because of the U.S. intervention in Afghanistan. They hunted them down, they killed the leader, Osama bin Laden, but uh, They've been playing a very strategic, long game, waiting it out, waiting the Americans in Afghanistan. They embedded themselves within the Taliban and other terrorist groups in the region. And now they seem to uh, be having a good time because they, they, the U.S. is out of Afghanistan. Al-Qaeda is uh, branding this as a victory for them and the Taliban. And they have reestablished uh, training camps in Afghanistan. They started inviting jihadists from around the world to come back to so Al-Qaeda is not gone. It's still there and it's re-emerging. Hamas, another well-known terrorist group that has conducted suicide attacks over the years, targeted civilians. Hezbollah, similarly, a terrorist group that has targeted civilians. Uh, and, and Houthis, another one. These three are in the front line right now because they're involved in a war. The Haqqani Network and the Taliban. This is also a terrorist group, uh, although not all groups of the Taliban are listed as such. But the Haqqani network specifically, they've uh, conducted suicide attacks against diplomatic missions, uh, civilians, and, and, uh, and uh, they're, they're one of the most notorious groups within the Taliban. Uh, I'm going to use them as an example in slides later on. TTP, Pakistani Taliban, another terrorist group well known. They are fighting inside Pakistan right now. They are trying to establish an Islamic emirate there. They're, they're targeting uh, infrastructure projects and, and, and state practice. IMU, another well-known uh, terrorist group, Islamic Movement of Uzbekistan, is based in Afghanistan, but they are regrouping to try to uh, establish an Islamic state similar to Afghanistan right now in Uzbekistan and other Central Asian states. ETIM, the East Turkestan Islamic Movement, they are a uh, separatist terrorist group, uh, but because they are Islamist in nature, I put them in this list, and uh, they envision an Islamic state in the Xinjiang province of China. Now, proxy militias, uh, I have three examples here. 
What is the Fatimian Immun Brigade? Uh, this is a brigade that was established by Iran from uh, Afghans in, inside Afghanistan and Afghan refugees in Iran. They uh, established it to create a force to fight against uh, uh, Daesh in, in Iraq and in Syria. And they were used as, uh, in a way, you know, we, we call it peshmargas in our language, frontline soldiers, expendable, you know, uh, and, and, and a lot of them gave a lot of casualties in, in the war against ISKP. But uh, they still are there and they are being regrouped, regrouped right now and there are reports that they might be used in, in, in southern Lebanon in the conflict that's going on right now. This is a picture where the Supreme Leader of Iran is paying respects to the fallen soldiers. These are all Afghan nationals that were used uh, as part of the Fatimun Brigade in, in the war against ISKB. Uh, Fatimun Brigade played a key role in saving the Syrian regime from collapsing when, when they were facing the uh, IS, uh, Islamic State and the various other groups of opponents. Hezbollah, again, who we, we had them on the previous list, but they are a very good example of a proxy group where one country extends influence into another, so they deserve to be in this group as well. ANDSF, the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces, recently used as a proxy group as well. Uh, when the Taliban took over Afghanistan, more than 30,000 special forces from Afghanistan had to go to Iran to take refuge. They were highly trained. Uh, they were trained by NATO countries, Italy, UK, the United States. And because they fell in the hands of the Iranian regime, they were used uh, by Iran, transferred to uh, Russia. And initially, they were used to train the new recruits of, of uh, Russia in the war in, in their invasion of Ukraine. Uh, they trained hundreds of thousands of uh, new Russian uh, troops in the NATO format of battle. Uh, they, 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 these, these troops were experts of how NATO conducts battle. And that is one of the reasons why the Russian troops were able to evolve and, and, and pose a much more potent threat to fighting in Ukraine. Now, separatist groups are another non-state actor that is relevant to shadow economies, and we'll come to the shadow economies part soon. One of the well-known ones right now is the Baloch Liberation Army and its wing called the Majid Brigade. Uh, they have conducted spectacular attacks in Pakistan in the recent uh, months, and, and that puts them at the top of the list. TKK, uh, another separatist group, which is also a terrorist group, it falls in both categories. Uh, Long-standing insurgency in uh, Turkey and uh, <laughs> targeted civilian infrastructure there as well. And once again, I want to note here that separatist groups can be terrorists. TKK is a good example. But recently in the Moscow format, uh, which was a gathering of Central Asian, South Asian, Middle Eastern, and East Asian countries in, in Moscow. They were, they were talking about Afghanistan and a range of issues. In their statement, they, they, they noted the rising threat of separatist terrorism. So this term will be used more and more here on out. The new trend in non-state actors is mercenaries and private military companies. Although they've been around for decades, uh, but they really became prominent during the time of Blackwater, which was used uh, um, as a security, uh, provision of security for diplomatic uh, missions and diplomatic uh, uh, delegations in Iraq and Afghanistan, but their role expanded gradually in these two countries. Uh, then, due to some incidents in Iraq, Blackwater faced litigation and, and, and legal issues, and they were dissolved. But two uh, derivatives came out of it. One was the Frontier Resource Group. They're, they're still there. Their concept was that uh, weaker states need um, uh, security to be able to access remote mines and natural resources. And they uh, thought that mining and security need to go together. So their, their proposal is that they could secure uh, remote minerals and uh, then take a share of the mines for securing it. Another derivative is called Academy. They're more about training formal state uh, forces, um, and they, they've been training around the world. The more recent and uh, famous case is Wagner, private military company. Uh, they have been involved in the war in Ukraine, we know that, uh, but they also have been involved in the Sudanese war. They, uh, 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 there are allegations that they are uh, 
associated with, with a group uh, led by MIT who is fighting against the state. Uh, and uh, uh, there are also reports that in Sudan they have a, a session for a gold mine called the Kush Gold Mine, where Wagner Group takes a share of the revenues, but also the group that they're associated with. Niger is another example, the Sahel region in Africa. We've seen uh, multiple examples of them conducting uh, security for authoritative states. They've even been involved in coup d'etats, regime changes. They've played a pretty prominent role in that part of the world. It's also worth mentioning that Wagner also helped uh, the Syrian regime in, in their war against uh, their opponents, and, and they played an important role there. The new trend seems to be the Chinese private military companies, although there's no prominent name to list here because they change names wherever they go. It's often changing licenses, but they are a new phenomenon, mostly associated with the Belt and Road Initiative as they've emerged into Central Asia and, and, and parts of Africa where they have mining concessions, infrastructure projects, but uh, some of these projects are in insecure areas. If the local authorities are not able to guarantee security, uh, we've now seen uh, the, the emergence of Chinese uh, private security companies to fill that way. Now, I want to connect these non-state actors with the shadow economies. How do they interact with each other? When you have the growth of the shadow economy, uh, that is where sources of revenue emerge outside the state's uh, reach. Uh, that is, those, those sources of revenue are then used as funding by non-state actors. And we have examples of those later on in, in later slides. When these non-state actors find sources of funding, they become stronger, which leads to the weakening of the state and the state recedes in certain geographic regions. And when the state weakens, it leads again to the growth of the shadow economy. So it creates a vicious cycle that uh, continuously weakens the state as the non-state actors strengthen and the, and the formal economy re recedes. Now, to talk about the impact of shadow economy on the different types of non-state actors, I want to describe uh, the, the four groups of non-state actors and, and how dependent they are on, on shadow economy. Terrorist groups, for them, often their main source of revenue is from shadow economies because they, terrorist groups usually don't have uh, at least formally uh, established relations with state actors, and, and that is why they have to depend on, on the shadow economy to uh, raise revenues. Similarly, separatist groups, uh, often, with some exceptions, often we see uh, them uh, not being supported by other states, uh, uh, or even if it is, it's, it's not in an explicit manner, in a manner. And, and that's why separatist groups are often very dependent on shadow economy for raising their revenues. Proxy militias, for them, a key source of their revenue is the shadow economy, but not the main, because proxies often serve the interests of another state abroad. So we have seen evidence of them acquiring funding from other states, and, and but a, but a significant portion of their revenues are often derived from the shadow economy as well. In the case of private military companies, it's a lesser dependence on, on uh, sh shadow economies for sources of revenue because they, they're often in contract with, with different states. They, they get into agreements with them and that reduces their dependence. Here I will talk about the different categories of uh, illicit revenue that can be raised from the shadow economies by the non-state actors that we talked about earlier. One well-known uh, source is narcotics, uh, whether it's the opium trade or the heroin, which is processed from opium, whether it's uh, cocaine, captagon, a large uh, group of, uh, large category of drugs that are, that are often uh, smuggled uh, in the, Return on investment is very high in this sector. That is why it is a uh, primary uh, sources of revenue for terrorist groups, separatist groups. Uh, you would know, you, you probably heard that, you know, Afghanistan was one of the largest producers of uh, opium and, and uh, derivatives like heroin. Uh, but that went hand in hand with the Taliban's uh, insurgency and, and the opium trade was considered a primary source of the Taliban's uh, revenues when they were insurgent terrorist group. 
Uh, we've seen uh, uh, other, you know, in, in Syria, we've seen the rise of Captagon and the war expands there. Uh, that's used as a source of revenue in, in South America. We've also seen the FARC militias and, and, and their war in their state was largely funded by the profits. One that is not often talked about is human trafficking. We've seen in the last decade a significant increase in, in migration uh, to Europe, uh, to South America, and then through the southern border to the U.S. Uh, we see the humanitarian side of it. We see the uh, uh, administrative side of it. But what we don't see is that often the groups that facilitate the movement are non-state actors, such as terrorist groups. They uh, create cross-border linkages that uh, allow them to move people. A good example of that is uh, in Afghanistan uh, in 2014 to 15, a significant increase in migration to Europe. I was serving in Istanbul at that time and this was a portfolio that I was managing, and we kept seeing the Taliban's fingerprints in this, that they were facilitating people to go out of Afghanistan and into Europe. And uh, they were, in a sense, the human traffickers, the human smugglers. Now that the Taliban have become an administration in Afghanistan, so they are out of the shadow economy, they are a formal economy now, their space is being filled by ISKP. They are taking over the shadow economy in Afghanistan now. And uh, recently, we saw reports of uh, uh, ISKP or the Islamic State bringing individuals into the U.S. from the southern border. They are involved all the way from Afghanistan until getting people into the U.S. from the southern border. They manage this human uh, smuggling. Uh, it's very lucrative, uh, and then we can talk about it later in the Q&A. Illicit financial transfers. This requires a little bit more of an explanation. So while there are formal ways of transferring money through the SWIFT and, and, and system. But uh, in, in uh, where, there, where there's a large shadow economy in, in weaker states, Afghanistan, Central Asia, uh, an alternative method uh, of banking exists called the Hawala in some parts of the world, uh, the Punti system in other parts of the world. It's a very effective system. It's, it's shadow economies. It is not part of the formal banking system or the central bank. It's very effective because the transfers are instantaneous because of the relations between the different Hawala brokers. Uh, it's more uh, discreet. People cannot find out if you transfer money, and it is uh, based on trust. Yeah. And uh, to get money from one place to the other, ultimately for settlement purposes between different brokers, at times cash needs to be moved. And uh, that movement of cash from one place to the other is often uh, engaged uh, by non-state actors, uh, the Taliban, specifically the Haqqani network, which I mentioned earlier, they were in charge of a lot of these movements in the South Central Asia region. Um, many Hawala brokers that were arrested by the Afghan state from 2001 to 2021 were found to be associated with them, were securitizing their operation to move cash across borders, and of course, for a commission. Sanctions evasion is another uh, area where non-state actors are finding good source of revenue. We've seen a rise of sanctions on, on Russia, on Iran, on a range of countries, but we also see that there's a lot of evasion, that uh, products are still transferred across uh, borders, payments are still made between uh, traders in these countries, and, and it is often not state-led uh, institutions or officially registered companies that engage in sanction evasion by default. They, they, they would not be allowed to do that and they would be penalized. So uh, that's where the non-state actors come in. They allow for the smuggling of goods. And then, as we said earlier, through illicit financial transfers, they can settle payments for these goods. And as sanctions increase in that part of the world, the market for non-state actors to evade sanctions increases, a very lucrative source of revenues for them. Mineral smuggling is another very good lucrative uh, sector for non-state actors. Why? Because Often, natural resources are in remote parts of the country. They're not in cities. They're in the mountains and the deserts. And, and, and in, weaker, in places where the state's uh, rate is weaker, uh, the state is not able to access uh, remote uh, mineral sites. But the non-state actors are. They're by default in remote places. So uh, we, we see that uh, in, in, in the case of uh, conflict zones, weak states, it is the non-state actors that uh, 
illegally uh, uh, extract minerals. They, they use artisanal techniques such as dynamite and basic uh, equipment. They get the minerals out and they smuggle them. It's a good source of revenue for them. Uh, this needs a bit more explanation, local security costs. So in remote areas, in, in many weak states, you still need infrastructure development. Uh, you can't abandon them. So ADB, Asian Development Bank, still spends money in these remote places. World Bank still does. Uh, other NGOs, they still build local irrigation, roads, transition, transmission lines. But because they're in remote areas outside the region of the state, security in those areas can only be guaranteed by non-state actors. So we've seen this in Afghanistan and different parts of the world where uh, it is difficult for these multilateral development banks to secure their projects to state-led security forces. They can't access that area. So they make deals locally with, uh, with, uh, with, with local non-state actors. Uh, these deals are usually termed as community development expenses, or they, they, they find a way to, to legalize it. But uh, one of the main sources of revenues, as an example, for the Taliban in the 20-year war in against NATO and, and the Afghan state was the cuts that they were receiving for providing local security for infrastructure. Often 20% of an infrastructure project in remote areas of Afghanistan would go into the pockets of the Taliban to charge for that, for allowing security of these projects. Now, the new trends in non-state actors, uh, one is blockchain currencies. Uh, they allow for discussion, again, they're easy, they're instantaneous, and, and uh, that is why it's a new phenomenon is that, that a lot of non-state actors are using uh, these currencies to settle payments. Uh, we had, uh, when, when I was working in the government of Afghanistan, we had reports that uh, even payments to certain terrorist groups to facilitate suicide attacks against opponents in Afghanistan were made at times through blockchain currencies. And, 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 and Bitcoin was one of the Payment that we use for that. Cybersecurity and hacking. This is another area where non-state actors are deriving revenues from. They, they can blackmail individuals by taking data and then giving back uh, uh, whatever they took in, in return for money. They can steal through bank accounts. Uh, but it's a primary source of revenue for non-state actors. Uh, and then internet connectivity has enabled non-state actors to connect with each other. It was more difficult for non-state actors to connect 30, 40, 50 years ago. Now they can uh, manage cross-border operations in a more effective manner due to internet connectivity. So these are the type of revenue sources that uh, can emerge from uh, shadow economies. And we discussed earlier the, the groups that benefit from it. So that's the end of the presentation. If you have questions, I would, we can go back to the slides and then talk about them each. Thank you. Doctor. As department chair, yeah. I'm going to take my privilege and ask the first question, and then the next can come later. Um, it's actually a two-part question. So one is that most of the groups that you highlight, in fact, all of the groups that you highlighted were um, ideological groups, Islamic. Um, what about non-Islamic, non-state actors that operate in this area, like, for example, in in Africa or in South America or something like that. And the second question is, are there particular groups that specialize in certain things, like the, the Taliban does drugs and this group does cybersecurity and this group does local security? Do you see some sort of differentiation, specialization by the different groups? Yeah. I'll just go back to the previous slides to answer that. So here, we talked about the four types. Of course, terrorist groups, proxy militias, separatist groups, mercenaries. So one of the non-Islamic categories, the mercenaries and the private military companies. Uh, separatist groups are also a non-Islamist uh, uh, because PKK's ideology is not driven by Islam, nor is the Baloch liberation armies. Uh, and then uh, we, I focus a lot on the terrorist groups because these are the most effective non-state actors. We, we see that they're the ones who are more able to conduct, conduct cross-border attacks, 
they are able to get geography as Al Qaeda has almost an entire state at their disposal in Afghanistan. And ISKP had a gap fit, and they still have geography in the eastern remote areas of Afghanistan. Hezbollah has a significant portion of a state at their disposal. Houthis are a state now. So why I focus on this? Because they are ideal examples of non-state actors that, that uh, can pose a threat. And, and they need a larger source of revenue to be able to achieve this success. But you're right, Doctor. There's a wide range of groups in Africa as well. There are ethnic-based militias that, that uh, cross border and, and act as non-state actors in, in that sphere as well. Uh, we had traditionally communist groups. Uh, that, that was another non-Islamic version of non-state actors. Part militias were an example of that. And even in Turkey, they're, they're still existing in, in some parts of the Middle East. So the, the examples are there, but, but the good examples would be uh, uh, Islamist terrorist groups because they have achieved the most success in terms of the non-state act. Now, with regards to specialization, that is a critical point, uh, in my opinion, Doctor, because right here in this line, there is a differentiation. What differentiates the Haqqani network from the Taliban? The Taliban derived a lot of their revenues from the the Haqqani network was different that they focused on other sources such as kidnapping, ransom. Uh, they were a semi-criminal uh, network, organized crime group, as well as an insurgency. That is why they were often uh, grouped as an autonomous group within the Taliban. They, they were also more involved in mineral smuggling because they, their traditional um, geographic uh, base was in the eastern part of Afghanistan, the mountainous part, and it was easy to access emeralds and rubies and these kind of minerals. So they were they were involved in that as well. And I'm sure you know with, with the different groups here and uh, Al Qaeda. I'll give you another example. So Al Qaeda recently was awarded a gold mine in Afghanistan, uh, in, the, in the north of Afghanistan, the Samti gold mine. Uh, it's it, the, the company that is that has the rights for that mine is an Al Qaeda associated company. So they are very interested in mining, but but in a larger scale. As as shocking as it might be, the, the company as Al Qaeda associated company is in partnership with a Chinese state company to extract that mine, and the Chinese company is helping them with the technical feasibility studies and and all of that. So yes, there is a specialization. We do see specialization among the different. There's a question on Yeah. So, uh, are there any for or private military companies created with Iran, or does it rely solely on terrorist groups? With regards to Iran, they rely solely on terrorist groups because they're cheaper, their expenses are less, more motivated. So, uh, I've read different figures and it's very difficult to verify, but, but I've always heard that their assistance with Hezbollah, uh, primary a very successful proxy group of Iran, was always in the hundreds of billions of dollars per year. Not a very large sum, but they've been able to do a much effective job with them than other countries have done with assistance worth billions of dollars. The, the difference is the ideology. When there is an ideology there, in this case, Islamist ideology, it makes up for a reduction in, in the amount of money you give them. They do the job for a much less price because there is an ideological. So Iran, in my uh, understanding, is, is relying on on, on uh, ideological Islamist foundation because it, it's cheap. May I? Thank you. Before I ask a question, I, I want to talk to the students and some some of the students here are in my class. I, I, I preach to them about how to do slides for a final presentation. Well, this is how you do it. Okay. I just, just wanted to, to say that because I, I think it's a very good illustration. Thank you for the clarity. I told them, don't put too many words, put major points. That's exactly how professionals do it. Thank you, Sayer, provided a, a, an example of how Thank to you do the doctor for teaching me this. Well, uh, you see, it's, a, it's all in the family then, okay? He taught you, you are teaching indirectly uh, our students. Mm -hmm. uh, Along the lines of what uh, Sean was asking, uh, in Africa, we see also quite a bit of activity. You, you focus primarily on the Middle East and, uh, and um, yeah. Afghanistan, but we are at the point in which a certain regions of Africa are completely destabilized. And 
non states that become failed states. I mean, West Africa, you've got Mali, you've got Niger, you've got uh, Nigeria. Again, there is an Islamic component, Boko Haram. I mean, you didn't list that, but I mean, it's part of the same family in, in, in Somalia. Al Shabaab, they've been around there for decades. You've got northern Mozambique. All those seem to be, if I'm not mistaken, also Islamic inspired. And unfortunately, quite successful. They do all the things you mentioned, including smuggling, you know, guns, gold, what have you. But so you got everybody there. But to the to the point in which certain states have become non-viable. Can you have any comments on that? And and what? How do you view the future of these regions? West Africa, Sudan, Wagner. There's everybody there. And the northern Mozambique, which is mineral rich. Any, any thoughts on that? Thank you. Yeah, that's a very good point. Thank you for raising it so I could talk a bit more about it. So there are at least four, four franchises we're discussing in this context. Of course, the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative that is there, we would see probably more private military companies from China appearing there to protect their, they, they, they are already there in Pakistan. China Pakistan Economic Corridor has been facing threats uh, from, from non state actors, so they're there, and I, I can only imagine they will appear in Africa sometime too. But besides the Chinese, there is the Wagner Group. They are highly involved with certain states, and, and they've even orchestrated who's in states where they were not uh, prominent, and now they are. Niger is a good example, uh, Sudan, another one. Uh, but then there's two other franchises we're noticing in that part. There's Al-Qaeda in Sahel region. That is an important franchise of Al-Qaeda. They're an umbrella group under which many terrorist groups fall. And then there's the Islamic State franchise. Now, interestingly, in, in, in uh, that part of the world, uh, Al-Qaeda and the ISKP, uh, Islamic State franchises don't look uh, eye to eye. Because Al-Qaeda, uh, we have not seen them clash with with weapons. Al-Qaeda's uh, leadership is now based in Iran. Saif al adad the leader of Al-Qaeda, lives in Iran. And uh, it is not likely that Al-Qaeda will target Russian assets in any part of the world. So we see a little bit of a harmony between Wagner and Al-Qaeda in that part of the world. But we don't see that uh, uh, harmony when it comes to the Islamic State, because Russia and the Islamic State fought in Syria. Uh, the, the Russians were defending the regime of Bashar al-Assad while the uh, Islamic State was one of their main opponents. And now that rivalry has spilled over to different parts of the world. Uh, we see uh, Wagner uh, group uh, engaged with, with uh, uh, terrorist uh, Islamist groups in, in, in Africa, but it's often those that are affiliated with the Islamic State. It's the continuation of the rivalry that they uh, developed in, in Syria. Thank you for the presentation. It was very insightful. But I don't want to open up another topic, but we've spoken about uh, the many threats that we've seen, most of them ideologically driven. So I wanted to ask, uh, on a global scale, we've seen how these threats have shifted, like as Sir Paulo mentioned, to Western Africa. Um, what are the steps that we've taken globally by maybe NGOs or international organizations to curb these issues. Like you mentioned, there are so many new ways that they are able to succeed, like cybersecurity and you know financially. So how have we been able to regulate curb these issues? And how can we do so in the long run? Thank you. So we saw in Afghanistan firsthand, but I think we can replicate this experience in other countries as well, especially with relate, with relate, in relation to Islamist uh, terrorist groups. Uh, three uh, prerequisites are often present when there is a rise in, in extremism in, in any part, especially in, in the Middle East, North Africa. One, weak states. When the state is weak, and they are ripe in corruption and, and Internally, disunity and their their writ over the geography is weak. 
it provides space for, for groups, non-state actors to emerge, whether it's criminal groups or terrorists or any other form. So the weakness of the state. Second prerequisite that we often see is the lack of education. When the state cannot provide schools in remote areas, madrasas fill the gap. Local mullahs start uh, opening madrasas and training uh, and, and educating um, the youth. So as an example, in the Afghanistan region, Pakistan region, that I'm an expert of this region, less of an expertise in Africa, uh, we have seen this. When the state is not able to provide schools in remote areas, the local mullahs create madrasa. They, in a very low-cost uh, mechanism, they give education. Now, anybody who, who graduates from madrasa is still considered as an educated person in that society. He or she is still considered a literate person because they can learn how to write, how to read, and, and, and uh, because the state is weak, uh, a very large portion of the society actually acquires education in that sense. But, but that is where uh, they become vulnerable to uh, Islamist terrorism. But of course, not all madrasas preach uh, jihad, and, and, or there are some madrasas that simply focus on religious issues, but, but it provides that, that ground for it. The third prerequisite that we see in states where these kind of non-state actors emerge is underdevelopment. When there is underdevelopment, when there is poverty, when there is a lack of infrastructure, uh, disenfranchisement is there, inequality emerges, and that is where the, the ground is paid for non-state actors to emerge there. So if we want a foundational, a fundamental resolution to this issue, we have to look at these three things. And uh, as long as these three prerequisites are there, one way or the other, the region will be battling with Ask a question. Yes. All right. I have a question. Um, no, I don't need a microphone. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned moving from the uh, the shadow economy to the formal economy, as the Taliban did when it took over. Yes. Um, recently, when they when they re-enter or enter the formal economy, do they stop all aspects of the shadow economy that they benefited from in terms of generating revenue? Does the Taliban not engage in? You had mentioned that ISKP has sort of taken over the drug trade in Afghanistan, but does the Taliban still have a finger in it? Are they still doing some of the illegal financial, cross border financial transactions or those type of things? That's a very good question. So I'll, I'll explain how the Taliban transitioned. I think the explanation itself will answer that. When the Taliban became a state, initially, uh, they, 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 the supreme leader of the Taliban oh, announced. Sorry, when they became a state the first time or the second, second time? time? The second, the second time, time. Okay. 2021. The Supreme Leader announced a soon after a ban on narcotics uh, production and uh, export. They announced a ban on the illegal extraction of minerals. Uh, why? Because they didn't need it anymore. The, the mineral trade brought upwards of $500 million. Uh, the narcotics trade brought upwards of $500 million of revenues for the Taliban when they were. Uh, group, when they became a state, they could now tax almost $3 million. But there was no need. Uh, that The cost of being involved in the narcotics trade was now higher than, than the benefit. Uh, if, if they were involved in narcotics as a state, uh, they, they would come under international pressure. Their, their objective to become recognized as a state would become more difficult. And now that the revenues were not needed because they were replaced by a much larger and more legitimate source of uh, revenue taxation and customs. Uh, they announced that ban. The same with minerals. They banned smuggling of minerals because they wanted the state to be involved in it, okay, so that the state revenues could increase uh, instead of uh, irresponsible. But, but the implementation, Doctor, was very difficult because often it was local commanders of the Taliban that were involved in the narcotics trade in the mineral extraction. They were not happy with the new mechanism. So if you're a local commander, was involved in narcotics trade, you were making tens of thousands of dollars a month, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars a month, and now your state is telling you no longer, you need to come on the payroll and make $200 a month of a salary. That's not a good deal for many of them. But there was a resistance. That's why it took the Taliban two years to reduce the trade in narcotics, still, still about 80% reduction on 20% uh, uh, narcotics production still going on and compared to before the and uh, they're having a difficult time. 
they're moving slowly about this because they're realizing when they push the local commanders to take their fingers off of these very lucrative trades and come on the payroll, many of them are actually mutinying from the Taliban and joining ISKP because that is what allows them to still have that, that shadow economy. So when we say that ISKP is now filling in the Taliban's shoes in the shadow economy, it's usually the same key individuals. They were earlier part of the Taliban, but now they're switching to ISKP and then they're becoming part of them. So the same with the mineral trade, the same with the smuggling route. So the smugglers, human smugglers, often still the same individual because it's a trust-based network. They just report to ISKP now. They're more affiliated with ISKP now than they were. It is not a smooth transition, but um, uh, the, the Taliban have been impressive in terms of reduction of narcotics. 80% is a large reduction. But it's primarily because they don't need that anymore. Sorry, not, not to go on indefinitely on this, but my curiosity is, at the time, even when the Americans were there, you know, that long period, the, the, the notion was farmers went for opium because they made money. That was a cash crop, and there was no way to pre prevent this from happening. It would, all kinds of things were, were tried, including defoliants and what have you. But you said the Taliban has been somewhat successful in reducing by 80%. So my question is, the farmers grow what then? If they cannot grow opium with the protection of the Taliban, or maybe now they have it with, with, the, with the Islamic State, but those who are now prevented from growing opium, what do they do to live? This is a very important point, uh, uh, Professor. So we uh, recently had uh, reports in the media, which I evaluated, I'm about to write something about that, where some European countries were worried about the speed with which the, the reduction of the drug trade was taking place in Afghanistan. Because many European countries, uh, especially those in the EU, uh, believe that yes, narcotics production needs to go down, but it needs to be replaced with something else for the farmers. Because if you don't transition them to another uh, crop, you're going to have migration. And that is why 8 million Afghans have left since the Taliban came to power. That's eight million. 8 million, 8 million. That's about 30 to 40 percent of the entire population has left. Another 8 to 10 million are in the waiting list to get passports to get out. And these are all, a lot of them are the same farmers that you're talking about that were simply forced to stop production of narcotics without really provision of any alternative crop or an alternative economy. It's leading to migration. Back to your question, those farmers are probably in Europe. Growing opium in Europe, I don't know. <laughs> they know how it, how it works, so maybe. Can I get another question? Sorry. <laughs> this will be the last one, because yeah. we're almost out of time. Um, so you had mentioned the uh, human trafficking networks, and that groups like ISKP are bringing people all the way from the beginning in Afghanistan to the border in the United States. One of the biggest tropes of the current election cycle is that terrorists are being led into the country. Are the people that ISPP is facilitating moving here actually terrorists? Uh, I think some of them could be. They could be terrorists. They could be people who have a potential to become terrorists. They might not yet be terrorists, but they might have similar ideology to the people who smuggle them here. And uh, uh, there could be normal individuals who simply paid the fee that, that was required and, and was a source of revenue for ISKP, so they were brought here. So all three of them are here. But uh, one thing to note is uh, in, 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 in Afghanistan, there's been a traditional relation between this group, the Afghanis and ISKP as well. The current Amir of the Islamic State of Khorasan province in Afghanistan was a former member of the Haqqani network. So Sanaul al Ghaffari, his name is. So uh, now, the Ministry of Interior of Afghanistan and the Taliban is controlled by this group. The minister himself is Sirajuddin Haqqani, the leader of the Haqqani network. And passports in Afghanistan are issued by this ministry. So there's been many allegations that this ministry, while it's under the Haqqani network, is also infiltrated by SKP. And they're able to get passports for individuals that they want to then migrate and smuggle into, into Europe and and the southern border of the U.S. I personally have seen evidence of passports being issued to non-Afghans. Uh, 
average Japanese factor. So uh, those individuals, I doubt that uh, it would be without a reason because giving someone a passport was not even an Afghan to begin with, there's probably some kind of an intention behind it. So I think a large portion of them probably could be terrorists or, or, or cells that could emerge later on. Anybody have any questions? All right. Well, thank you very much. Very kind of thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good. Sean, I, I, yeah. I suggest a picture. Yeah. Guys, our guest. Yes. Please, everybody. Thank you. No questions. Well, we can we turn the projector off? That would be a good idea. Otherwise, you can have a group. Otherwise, we, we yes. can say that you got it written on your face. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, everybody. We'll okay. meet you in the middle. And so have some yeah. people stand in the front too. Yeah. So you're in the middle. <laughs>